This is my 116th video on my work with OO Gauge. See part 1 of this series for my reasons for getting into OO Gauge when I already had a lot invested in working in N Gauge and I didn't really have space available for a large fully operational OO Gauge layout. Also see my lengthy series on my N Gauge railway modeling for smaller and more complex scenery and smaller scale trains running. This part deals with adding signals to my shelf layout. Signals are another of the many things that it is difficult, if not impossible, to do properly on a model railway. Other examples would be that our stations are always too small, our trains too short, and our curves are way too tight. These things really can't be avoided in modelling, at least in a domestic setting. To really implement proper signalling on a model railway would be extremely expensive and difficult, if it would be possible at all. For example, every time a train passes a signal set to safe, as soon as the train has passed, the signal should switch to danger to stop other trains entering the section. This is hardly feasible with a model railway. I certainly don't intend to attempt it, as it would require automated signals and presumably some sort of automated control system or multiple people operating things. Nevertheless, despite the fact that I really won't be able to operate signals fully properly, I do like to place signals in a way that might provide reasonably for safe control of movement on the tracks. I use Hornby and similar manually operated semaphore signals. Semaphore signals would mainly have been what was employed on the LMS in my period, the 1930s. The available manually operated signals all seem to be upper quadrant, which suits me as I prefer upper quadrant signals, as I believe did the LMS. I use the manually operated signals as a sort of compromise. They can at least be changed, even if that requires leaning over to operate the signal itself. I'd be happy if I could use electrically operated signals that could be set remotely, but even signalling a small layout such as this shelf of mine with manually operated signals was quite expensive, and the cost for using electrically operated signals throughout would be prohibitive, around a couple of thousand dollars, I think, if I could find them, to say nothing of the amount of work needed to install and wire them. So I compromise with manually operated signals. They're also not really entirely realistic looking, but they're not too bad, and kit-built signals, which might be made to look a bit more realistic, tend to be a nightmare to operate if they operate at all. Ratio's system for operating their kit-built signals with threads and pulleys seems horrendous to me. So, I needed to come up with a plan for adding signals to my shelf layout. Here's the schematic of the layout in its form as implemented. The parts in the middle cover the wiring of the control panel and needn't really concern us here. What I needed to do at this point was to come up with placement of signals that could reasonably control safe movement of trains on these tracks. At a minimum, the signals needed to provide for a way to prohibit any train movements that might lead to two trains colliding. There are cases where, in real life, a movement is allowed into a block that is occupied for example, to allow a loco to move into a station and couple to a train standing at the platform. Special come-ahead signals can be used for this purpose, or in other cases, specially authorised staff members may instruct train crew that they are allowed to pass a signal set at danger. Anyway, clearly I wasn't going to cover all of these fine points, but I did want to provide the basic signals for safe control. Here's what I came up with. Actually, this was about my third draft, but I won't bore you with my initial errors. The red numbers represent semaphore signals. Ones represent single post signals. Twos represent double post junction signals. The lines next to the numbers represent the direction in which the signal faces, i.e. the signal will apply to trains coming from the direction of the line and so the coloured side of the signal arms will face in that direction. Based on this plan, I would need seven junction signals and six singles. This plan omits some signals that would normally be required, where things are so close together that one signal can reasonably be used to cover more than a single purpose. 
Here I've added some more keys to make discussion of the signals easier to formulate and easier to follow. The signals themselves are identified by small blue numbers at the ends of their directional lines. There are small green numbers beside the points to identify those. The platforms on the two stations are numbered in black. Small blue lines have been added from the signal numbers indicating what the signal applies to. I'm going to run through my intentions with respect to the purpose of each of these signals. I apologize if this is boring for some. You can always skip forward in YouTube. OK. Signal 1 is a junction signal just before point 1, which branches to the siding from the line coming out of platform 1 on the lower station. The primary purpose of this signal is to act as the junction signal for that point. If the left arm of this signal is set to safe, trains may proceed and will turn on the point into the siding. If the right arm of this signal is set to safe, trains may proceed and will continue straight on the main line. If both arms are set to danger, trains must stop. Under no circumstances should both arms be set to safe. This signal also serves two additional purposes due to the proximity of things. It serves as the passing signal for point 3, the crossover point. If the right arm of signal 1 is set to safe, this not only implies that point 1 is set straight, but also that point 3 is set straight. If point 3 is set to turn, allowing crossover with the line from platform 2, the right arm of signal 1 will be set to danger. The third purpose that signal 1 serves is as the starter for platform 1. Since it is so close to the end of platform 1, it should readily be seen by trains in platform 1. Trains may only move out from platform 1 if one or other arm of signal 1 is set to safe. Signal 2 is the junction signal just before point 2, which allows crossover between the lines from platforms 1 and 2. If the left arm of signal 2 is set to safe, trains may proceed and will cross over to the other line, so points 2 and 3 must both be set to turn. If the right arm of this signal is set to safe, trains may proceed and will continue straight on the main line. If both arms are set to danger, trains must stop. Under no circumstances should both arms be set to safe. Signal 2 also serves as the starter for Platform 2, since it is so close to the end of Platform 2 it should readily be seen by trains in Platform 2. Trains may only move out from Platform 2 if one or other arm of Signal 2 is set to safe. Signal 3 is the starter for Platform 3. Trains may only move out from Platform 3 if Signal 3 is set to safe. This signal also has a distant arm indicated by the yellow line under the 1. This distant arm applies to the right arm of Signal 8 at the point round the corner. If that distant arm is set to safe, trains may expect the right arm of Signal 8 to be set to safe, allowing them to proceed through point 4 onto the line into Platform 2 of the upper station. If the distant arm on Signal 3 is set to danger, trains must expect the right arm of Signal 8 to be set to danger, so they will need to stop before point 4. Signal 4 is the home signal for Platform 3. It must be set to safe for trains to proceed into Platform 3. Normally, all station platforms would have a home signal, but I have largely dispensed with them, as there are other signals on the line just before the stations. However, this is not the case for Platform 3 of the lower station, so I included a home signal there. Signal 5 controls trains in the siding. If Signal 5 is set to safe, trains may proceed out of the siding onto the main line towards the station. This would imply that point 1 is set to turn and that there is currently no train in the station on platform 1. Signal 6 is the junction signal for point 3, the crossover point, for trains coming towards the lower station. If the left arm of signal 6 is set to safe, trains may proceed and will cross over to the other line, so points 2 and 3 must both be set to turn. If the right arm of this signal is set to safe, trains may proceed and will continue straight on the main line into platform 1. So this signal also serves as the home signal for platform 1.
If both arms are set to danger, trains must stop. Under no circumstances should both arms be set to safe. Signal 6 also serves as the passing signal for point 1, the siding point. If the right arm of signal 1 is set to safe, this not only implies that point 3 is set straight, but also that point 1 is set straight. Signal 7 is the passing signal for point 2, the crossover point. If signal 7 is set to safe, trains may proceed through point 2 into platform 2. So this signal also serves as the home signal for platform 2. If signal 7 is set to danger, trains must stop before point 2. Signal 8 serves as the passing signal for the two lines from platforms 2 and 3 of the lower station coming into point 4. If the right arm of signal 8 is set to safe, a train coming on the line from platform 3 may proceed through point 4 onto the line into platform 2 of the upper station. If the left arm of signal 8 is set to straight, a train coming on the line from platform 2 of the lower station may proceed straight through point 4. Trains on either line must stop if the arm that applies to them is set at danger, and of course both arms can never be set to safe. Signal 9 is the junction signal for point 4, the branch line point for trains coming from the upper station. If the left arm of signal 9 is set to safe, trains may proceed and will turn into the branch line. If the right arm of this signal is set to safe, trains may proceed and will continue straight on the main line. If both arms are set to danger, trains must stop. Under no circumstances should both arms be set to safe. Signal 10 is the junction signal for point 5, the crossover point, for trains coming towards the upper station. If the left arm of signal 10 is set to safe, trains may proceed and will cross over to the other line, so points 5 and 6 must both be set to turn. If the right arm of this signal is set to safe, trains may proceed and will continue straight on the main line into platform 2, so this signal also serves as the home signal for platform 2. If both arms are set to danger, trains must stop. Under no circumstances should both arms be set to safe. Signal 11 is the passing signal for point 6, the crossover point. If signal 11 is set to safe, trains may proceed through point 6 into platform 1. So this signal also serves as the home signal for platform 1. If signal 11 is set to danger, trains must stop before point 6. Signal 12 is the junction signal just before point 6, which allows crossover between the lines from platforms 1 and 2. If the left arm of signal 12 is set to safe, trains may proceed and will cross over to the other line, so points 5 and 6 must both be set to turn. If the right arm of this signal is set to safe, trains may proceed and will continue straight on the main line. If both arms are set to danger, trains must stop. Under no circumstances should both arms be set to safe. Signal 2 also serves as the starter for Platform 1, since it's so close to the end of Platform 1, it should readily be seen by trains in Platform 1. Trains may only move out from Platform 1 if one or other arm of Signal 12 is set to safe. Finally, Signal 13 is the starter for Platform 2 of the upper station. Trains may only move out of Platform 2 if Signal 13 is set to safe. Signal 13 also serves as the passing signal for point 5, the crossover point. If signal 13 is set to safe, this will also imply that point 5 is set straight and trains may proceed straight through. Conversely, if point 5 is set to turn, creating a crossover between the tracks, signal 13 must be set to danger. All of this is somewhat theoretical. As mentioned, I'm not going to be able to set signals to danger as soon as trains have passed through them, and I won't be running around changing signals every time the shuttle control sends a train back in the opposite direction, although obviously signals should change in that case, as signals should never permit travel in opposite directions on the same line at the same time. What I will try to do is at least keep the signals set to properly correspond to the setting of the points, and I may fuss a bit more about the setting of signals correctly when I'm taking photographs. 
I apologise if all that was too much boring detail. Now I shall pass on from the theory to the actual preparation and placing of the signals. As noted here, my plan called for seven junction home signals and six single home signals. I generally don't get into distance signals, as in OO scale, distance signals should really be 17 feet before the home signal to which they correspond. I had been buying whatever signals I came across locally or with cheap shipping, and I hoped that I might have enough on hand. But when I checked, this was what I had. I had six single post signals, all homes, except for one that had both home and distant arms. That one was an old Hornby double-O item. Then I had three junction home signals, two Hornby and one Triang. And I also had a junction distance signal and a Hornby signal extension set. Here's everything out of its packaging. The signal extension set would allow me to convert the junction distance signal to a junction home, but that would still leave me with only four junction home signals, and I needed seven, so I was going to need to obtain three more before I could implement my signaling plan. The Hornby signal extension set was a very handy thing, which sadly Hornby don't sell any more. It provided you with two upper posts with home arms, two distant arms on mountings that could be added to posts, two sets of platform railings for the platform on the signal, more on those things soon, and three platforms, two for going on the side of a post and one for going between two posts so you could build a gantry using the set. I used the extension set that I had to convert the junction distance signal into a junction home. I took off the side post with a distant arm and replaced it with one of the posts with a home arm from the extension set. The top of the main post doesn't come off, so to switch that to a home I had to take things apart to replace the semaphore arm itself. Here's a close-up of one of those upper arms. These just push into a square hole in the platform, so it's quite easy to pull one out and replace it with another. So I was able to pull out the post with a distant arm and replace it with one of the posts with home arms that came ready assembled in the extension set. However, to change the distant arm on the main post to a home, it was necessary to actually take things apart, as that main post is a continuous part from bottom to top, even though the upper section of it above the platform is thinner. To take things apart, first we remove the pin that holds the semaphore arm to the post and pivots it. This is most easily done by pushing a sharp pair of tweezers in behind the semaphore arm at the pivot point. Then we can gently lever pushing the tweezers forward until the pin comes out. With the pin out, the semaphore arm is just hooked onto the control wire. There's the pin, separate, and the plastic semaphore arm is just held onto the end of the control wire by a turn in the end of that wire hooked into a small arm in the control lever of the semaphore. There's no glue involved in any of this. The arm just stays on the wire when the signal is assembled because with the pivot pin in place the arm can't rotate. But now we can simply rotate the semaphore arm to detach it from the control wire. So now we've completely detached the arm, and we can replace it with a different one. The other end of the mechanism with a balance weight and lever can be taken apart in the same way by pulling the pin and rotating out the control wire. But there's no need to do that just to change over the semaphore arm. To replace the arm, we just thread the new arm onto the hook at the end of the control wire, making sure to get it the right way round so that when it's rotated on, its painted side faces outward. Like so. And then we're ready to reinsert the pivot pin. The simplest way is to put the pin through the hole in the semaphore arm and then guide it into the hole in the post and press down. And our new arm will be installed except I was just mucking around demonstrating for these pictures, so I've actually reinstalled the distant arm. This was one of the junction home signals that I had. I didn't need to make any changes to the semaphore arms, but it came to me with its railing not fitted, still as supplied by Hornby. 
These railings don't come fitted when you buy the signals new from Hornby. The railing just comes as a piece of straight wire with little plastic posts threaded onto it. You have to bend the wire to shape yourself and then fit it to the platform by inserting the bottoms of the plastic posts into the holes in the platform. This is not easy to do. Bending the wire to exactly the correct shape is a real challenge, and I can only ever seem to manage to approximate. It isn't easy to get the plastic posts to stay in their holes. Sometimes, if you get the rail bent exactly parallel, you can manage it without any glue, but I had to resort to some glue on this one. The end post, at the very end of the platform, is almost impossible to fit properly, as it's the same length as the other posts, but its hole is much lower down. I guess Hornby realised this at some point, as the railings they ship now only come with six posts, even though there are still seven holes in the platform. But this was an old one, so it had seven posts. I checked around for my options for obtaining the other three junction home signals that I needed, Buying them from the UK was going to get quite expensive with the price in pounds and the shipping. I ended up buying these items seen here, which Nigel with British Model Trains in Cambridge, Ontario, near me, had in stock. On the left are three signal extension sets. I was really quite surprised that he had so many of these, but he'd picked up some old stock when he bought out another vendor. As I said, Hornby sadly don't have these as an item anymore. With those three extension sets, I would be able to convert junction distance signals to junction homes. Nigel didn't have any junction homes in stock, but he had new junction distance and one used junction distance with only one post, which wasn't a problem as I would get spare posts with the extension sets. So I bought two brand new junction distance and the used partial ones and the three extension sets. All of this cost me about the same as buying a couple of signals from the UK, probably less actually. Here's the used partial signal on the bench together with the contents of one extension set. I'll just pull the post with the distant arm and fit two posts with home arms from the extension set. I'll take out the track clip as well, as my shelf layout is mainly made with Pico points and flex tracks, so the Hornby track clips aren't going to work with it. Those are designed to push into gaps under the rails that are provided at certain points on Hornby track. And here is that signal with the conversion completed. The rest of the items at right can go back into the extension set box for possible future use. Here are a new Hornby distance signal in its packaging and one of the extension sets on the bench. And here they are unpacked. I will need to replace the short post with one with a home arm from the extension set. For the main post, I will need to replace the distant arm with a home arm taken from one of the extension set posts by pulling the pivot pins as previously discussed. I'll also need to fit the confounded railing to the platform. And here is the signal with all of that done. Note that these new signals came with railing wires with only six plastic posts. Although there are also railing wires with seven posts in the extension set. And here's a second one done the same way, as I had two of these new Hornby Junction distance signals and two extension sets to go with them. So, here are four signals ready to go back from the bench after being worked on. The two that started as new Hornby Junction distance signals are on the left, then the one that started as a used signal with only one post, and finally on the right, the one to which I just fitted the railing. Now, I actually had enough signals to implement my plan. Here they all are, ready to go. The jar contains some little nails that I intended to use to keep the signals in place on the layout. The older Hornby and Triang signals turned out to have holes so big that the heads of those nails went right through. So I had to search for some larger nails for those signals. It was quite a bit of work fitting all of the signals in place on the layout. As usual, having to lean across my main Hornby layout to get at parts of the shelf layout made it more difficult. Here are the signals near the Hornby station, seen looking out from beside Platform 3 of the station. 
Now that we're looking at actual signals in place, just a couple more comments on what the various arms indicate. Arm A is indicating were there a train coming out of platform 1, where the precedent is at left in this picture, can pass through the point, turning into the siding. Arm B is indicating whether a train coming out of platform 1 can pass through the point proceeding straight on the main line, and also may proceed straight through the next point. If both arms A and B were at danger, then any train on platform 1 would need to wait for the signal to change. Arm C is indicating whether a train coming out of platform 2, just seen at bottom left, can pass through the point turning to cross over onto the other line, so also passing through the point on the other side of the crossover. Arm D is indicating whether a train coming out of platform 2 can pass through the point on the main line. If both arms C and D are at danger, then any train in platform 2 needs to wait for the signal to change. Note that arms B and C should never be safe at the same time, as B safe implies that the crossover point is straight, whereas C safe implies that both crossover points are set to turn. Arm E indicates that a train may start out of platform 3, the line at bottom right. The distant arm F should reflect the state of the signal at the point up around the corner. If F is set up, that implies that the train may expect the signal at the point to give it permission to pass through. If F is set down, that implies that the train must expect the signal at the point to be set to danger, requiring it to stop. Here are those signals seen from the other direction. Note that all of the signals for trains coming from this direction are set to danger. This makes sense, but as noted, it won't really be possible to keep all of this correct in normal operations, unless I want to spend more time changing signals than actually moving trains. Here are the signals seen from the corner going towards the superquick station. The signal at the point is set to allow a train coming from the branch line to pass onto the main line. There seems to be still a lot of static grass stuck on those tracks. I gave those tracks some more vacuuming after seeing this picture. Here we're looking in basically the same direction, a bit closer to the superquick station. The signals are set to allow trains coming in on both lines to proceed into the station. And here we are looking out of that station back the other way. I've left all of the signals for this direction at danger at this point. So that's it for now. Here are all of the signals by the Hornby station, which would presumably all be controlled from Hatley Box, built from the ratio kit, seen at left here.